Hey, thanks for tuning in today. I just want to give a little update about how things are going and kind of some new direction that we're trying to explore. And it's going to actually take a little bit of feedback from everybody watching. And so I'd like people to be able to give some thumbs up uh, to things that, uh, that they do like in some of the changes we're doing. But one of the consistent things that has kept coming up is in our channel starting when COVID first really kicked off, um, we tried a lot of different things and there were things that, that people enjoyed and things that wouldn't didn't and things that made an impact and things that didn't. And one of the consistent things that keeps coming back around is the fact that a lot of people are missing the musical worship aspect um, that oftentimes come with the church services and the rest. And that's not something that I've been able to consistently provide on this channel. And so I have teamed up with, uh, ultimately par partnered with a, a worship pastor to try to provide that. And so we're gonna kinda go down that road for a little while and just seeing what that's like in providing that and a different element to be able to bring to our online uh, church service, that it would almost be a complete church service rather than just the message and just God's word on that because I do believe it's very important for us to have the musical worship aspect ahead of time because I believe there's a settling in our soul, a really an ultimate tone setting to, to our hearts to hear God's word in that. And so we're going to explore this avenue for a little while to see if, uh, if this is something that works and something that people like. So please do me a favor, comment down below, uh, give a thumbs up if you do like the changes that we're making here, uh, just so we get a little feedback and know where we should go from here. So as always, thanks for tuning in and let's get on to the message here today. Hello everyone, glad to see you here today for worship. We're gonna start worship today with a call to worship from Psalm 86. So if you have your Bibles out, you can turn to Psalm 86 or it will be up here on the screen. So here is our call to worship from Psalm 86. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Let's worship. of our God and King Lift up your voice and let us sing Oh, praise Him Alleluia Thou burning sun with golden beam Thou silver moon with salt to
pray with me? Lord, in times like these, we need your mercy. But not just in our own personal lives, but the world as a whole. So we ask now simply, Lord, show us your mercy. Every day for everyone, Lord, show us your mercy. Amen. Romans 5 says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. Like a river attendeth my way when souls like sea billows roll whatever my love thou hast torn me to say it is well it is well with my soul it is well with my soul it is well
is well It is well with my Thank you for the gift of worship. Even when everything around us is changing, we know that you do not. So today we thank you and we praise you for your unchanging grace, for your unending love, and for your unmatched glory. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for tuning in this weekend's online church service. I hope as part of the the new things we're doing, I hope you really enjoyed uh, that musical aspect. And I just want to really reiterate with that, that if that's something that you you are liking as we do it, give it a chance. Um, Give us a thumbs up. Put a little bit of something down in in that note so that we can uh, 
we can see if that's something that we should continue on with or not. And uh, I thank you for kind of piloting that with me and helping me through this time for us to figure out if that's that's where we want to go. We're going to take an actual little break this week from our uh, Ephesians series. And it's not really a break, but it's a kind of a, a quick little detour that I think is important for us to do. I've had a lot of conversations with people through this series and, and it's provoked some things in people as, they, as, they, as they've sat in it, as they've walked down. Last week we talked about the six walks that, that Paul talks about us having and um, working through those things and, and really ultimately the idea that we were dead before and now we're alive in Christ, that re, being, being reborn aspect of our life, that we would, we would not be resisting the Holy Spirit, but we would ultimately be uh, desire Him to work in us and through us. And so... In these conversations, uh, there's a certain element that keeps coming up, and that element is the idea of like a guilt or a shame, a depression. Um, almost, uh, the, the people will reflect, and they'll get to a place where maybe they're not doing something that they feel like they should. There might be a conviction from the Holy Spirit. There might be a place in their life where it's kind of showing them something that maybe they don't like, and and people respond to that in a couple different ways. And I don't want to talk about the way they respond. I want to ultimately talk about the way we should respond. But I think a great way for us to be able to do that is look to see how someone in the Bible responded to that. And so Asaph is a priest that wrote several of the Psalms. And we'll be in Psalm 77 today. But he ultimately has written multiple Psalms. And some of my favorite Psalms, as a matter of fact, have been written by him in his heart. He is willing to have this openness about him that I think is just genuine, that is really quite incredible, as a matter of fact. And I believe that's what God wants for us in our life. And so if you felt like there's been a conviction or something's come up in your life in reflection and you feel like there's a, a shame or a guilt or something that makes it depressive because there's just a lot going on in life and it just feels like it, the world is bearing down on you, there's actually a proper way for us to handle that biblically in a model and Asaph is going to walk us through that. And so if you have your Bibles and you want to follow along, we're going to be in, in uh, Psalm 77 here today. And what I really want to talk about is, isn't it amazing all the personalities that you get throughout the Bible. That, that oftentimes just ordinary people do extraordinary things because they allowed God to use them in those things. And Asaph is one of those, but he's not the only one. There's a lot of personalities that we see throughout the Bible when we study it, which is why I believe it gives us such a great example of how we need to be in our life to keep a deepening relationship with the Lord, a real rich relationship with Him. Um, you know, when we become aware very quickly of all these different personalities in the Bible, we can start to associate with some of them. And one of them, you know, one of the personality things that come up quite often is the idea of that shame, that guilt, that depressive state. And I think Job is probably one of the greatest examples of that, is like the singled out man of God, blameless and upright in all that he did, who's ultimately staggering and loses and for a really long and painful period in his life, really everything. And it brings him to a really low place in his life. Such a low place that if you read about Job in Job chapter 7, verses 6 and 7, he says, My days, they come to an end without hope. My eye will never again see anything good. Like, think about that concept. Think about how low he must have been in that moment. Never again will I see anything good in my life, that everything that is happening is so bad, so rough. You know, Moses even descri is described as the meekest man on earth in Numbers 12, and he rises up as one of the greatest examples of an ordinary man who ultimately was amazing because of his submission to God and walking out what God had for him in his life. He became one of the greatest of all Old Testament characters that people love to study because of that. You know, he was faced with such a huge task of being a leader and ultimately a general answerer of, of things as a man to million Hebrew people. He was responsible for them to bring everything to him and he would speak as God spoke to him about the answers of the things that they needed to do. He was the administrator of God's law. He was a role in which all was assigned to him by God in that. But, but one made more complicated by the tendencies of the people around him. 
life can get so much more complicated in our life because of the people around us and what they need, what they ask for, the things they bring to the table. And then we look at how we're supposed to be as a light of the world, as a salt of the earth, like we talked about last week, how difficult that is. When you look at Moses, the, the Israelites, they griped, they doubted God, and they even got to a place where they would attack Moses and they threatened to kill him several times. So they, there came a time in Moses's life where he felt the crushing weight of that pressure and that assignment, and he cries out to the Lord. We In Deuteronomy 1.12, he says, how can I bear the troubles, the burdens, and the disputes of these people by myself? And then look at Elijah. Elijah was one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, and he asked for his life to be taken. It was so bad at one time. Look at David and his efforts to hide his sin. He, he has multiple journal entries in Psalms and for his history in First and Second Kings and First and Second Samuel, and the idea of uh, the, how much he lost totally in his strength in trying to, to walk out those things. If you read in Psalm 32, verse 2, he says, The ebony way of all that is worthwhile in life and groaning all day long. Like that speaks of an agony. That speaks of a hurt. That speaks of a lot of pressure in a person's life. And look at the character of Jonah. You know, Jonah is the first foreign ministry that became deeply de dependent when God did, did not destroy Nineveh. He was called to be there. He wanted him to destroy it. And instead, God called him to it. And so he just got, he got so afraid, he got so depressed, he, got, he just couldn't function, almost to the point where he couldn't even do anything. And Jeremiah was so profoundly sad that he, he is known to this day as the weeping prophet. And he confessed that he wished he had never been born. Like that takes a serious weight on somebody's life and dealing with problems to wish you had never been born. You look at Nehemiah and... and Ezekiel and Peter and more and more of these guys and the troubles they had and the pressures and how they cried out to God. So anybody that's in the company of depression is in noble company ultimately because that's what happened to these amazing people in the Bible that we read about quite often. And so oftentimes we talk about discouragement and depression in our life and the things that come and all our hearts have felt it. Every one of us has known a time in our life where we've had a setback, we've, we've had a loss, that we've been disheartened over a lot of stress, that we've felt like we've had the enemy's attacks in our life. But what adds to the burden and the, de and the depression is the, the common misguided notion that a good Christian doesn't get depressed. And I really want to talk about that concept here today because, you know, there, there's a lot of, a lot of church uh, upbringing out there that has has led to this cliche that ultimately you just you just need to have more faith to get past that or remember rejoice in the Lord always remember rejoice or sometimes it comes off like a pet pep talk and ultimately it's the idea that come on get up let's let's get moving together you know come on get yourself together quit stop and stop with this pity party stuff and what will people think of God if you act this way, if you're like this. And of course, that simply pushes those who are in the depressed state ultimately into a deeper depression. But it also teaches them in discouragement that if you don't want to hear it again, you got to fake it to make it. That if I don't fake my happiness, then, then this is going to carry on in my life. Well, neither one of those concepts deal with the root of the issue to overcome with victory the way Christ would ask us to have victory in our life. Instead, I want to show you a different model of that, that God, as we draw closer to him and we come with that truly contrite heart, that broken heartedness, that not only does he not want us to hide that from him, he encourages us to lay it on the ground. And so ultimately, the first thing I want to say is, is, in verses 1 through 3 of Psalm 77, it says, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In my day of trouble, I sought the Lord. My hands were lifted up all night long. I refuse to be comforted. I think of God. I groan. I meditate. My spirit becomes weak. We have got to send up an SOS to God. We have got to ask for that help. We have got to let him know that we are in need. 
Because if it's all about how it looks and what the perception of it is, we miss the root and the heart of what's going on. And when the heart is hurting, it has to be healed. It has to become an overcoming. When we look at this, right away we, we hear the hopelessness in Asaph. He draws a picture of words that really is about desperation. And I believe there's a lot of people in this world, a lot of people in communities all over the United States that that are in that hopelessness, that despair, that, that are believers, that are Christians, but but there's something heavy in their life and it makes it debilitating. And my wife and I, we, all, we often talk about the idea that if, if the devil won't make you bad, he'll make you busy. But then we also know that if he can't make you bad and he can't make you busy, then all he has to do is make you ineffective. So whatever it takes for him to make us ineffective means we're not making an impact for Christ in people. And a lot of times feeling that despair and being in that hopelessness If we have a panic about us and we don't overcome and we can't get past that, we become ineffective for Christ. You know, Asaph felt like he was in this dark tunnel, only there's no light at the end of that tunnel for him. So when he when he says his soul refuses to be comforted, he means he's he's tried to shake it off. That he's tried to overcome. That he's been trying to get past it. But it isn't working. Because if it was, he'd already be sharing the victory of it. Look at how he closes here in verse 3 of that bit. He says that when he meditates, so when he ponders the situation, trying to think of his way through these problems, his spirit becomes weak, it says. So his emotions sabotage his own reasonable thinking. The escape of sleep eludes him, it says. It says he stretched out his hand like a drowning man longing to be saved. Think about that concept. He's wanting to be saved. He's wanting to be chased after. He's wanting the help that is needed for him to be able to have that. You know, maybe you can identify with ASAP and his feelings, but don't miss what his first response is here. In this battle with depression, he doesn't pretend. He doesn't bury his disillusions. He doesn't fake it till he makes it with the happiness. There's no indication that he turned to food or to drugs or to drinking or to shopping or to pornography or to gambling or to um, leaning on unhealthy people relationships to, to cope with the situation at hand. Instead, he got honest with God. When is the last time You just got on your knees and were honest with God in where you were in life, in your struggle. Because here, he's really honest with the Lord. You know, I cry out aloud to God, aloud to God. He shouted to God. He yelled his prayer. Verse 3, he described this further. I think of God. I groan. And the word groan can mean everything from a quiet noise to a raging explosion. If you were angry, Share that. If you are hurt, share that, but don't tuck it in. Lay it at the foot of the cross so that you can have that conversation of honesty with the Lord in exactly where you are, not to hide it. You know, in verses 7 and 9, Asaph fills in some of those some of those prayer information that we need in this. So we we see he's hurting. We see he feels like he's absolutely helpless. But this is what verses 7 through 9 says. It says, Will the Lord reject forever and never again show favor? Has his faithful love ceased forever? In his promise to an end for all generation? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? You know, Asaph cycled through this wide and uncontrollable rage of emotions that were just coming out of him. And he didn't try to hide that from God. You know, don't hide the things that are swirling around in you. Sometimes we need that, that verbal processing. Sometimes we need that emotional processing with the Lord. The Lord already knows it's there. We're not hiding anything from Him. It's, are we willingness? Are, do we have a willingness in our hearts to be honest with the Lord in those things? Especially the things He already knows. You know, when we read this stuff in what Asaph is going through, he was real. He had a reverence of the Lord. He was honest, 
and still humble in how he brought it to the table. He asked God to, the hard question that depression raises in our, in our hearts. And he found no indication that God would put it off, that he would just do nothing with it. Instead, he found that connection. You know, that wisdom of one thing, that unity, that, that relationship we have with him, it has to be one that we are really ultimately willing to give it all to him. All the hurt, all the frustration, all the goodness, all the great things, all aspects of our life, including that which puts a shame in our life. Don't be ashamed to admit when you're just going through things in your life and there's a horrible battle going on inside of you. God wants to hear that. He wants to help straighten it out for us. He wants to help come along. As a matter of fact, the Bible promises that. In Psalm 34, 18, he says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. When we have that and we're honest, like that's a promise from the Lord that we're comforted, that we're saved, that He's our refuge in those times. To pour your heart out, whether it be loud or whether it be soft, pour your heart out to the Lord because He wants to hear from you. If you read Psalm 51, if you go back and track it in the history of, of David's life, you know that that is the emotional explosion, the emotion that he's laying on the table to the Lord of his, his contrite heart and what he did in killing Bathsheba's husband and, and, and sleeping with her. That His brokenness is written in those words. God wants us to bring our brokenness willingly to him, to pour out our heart as loud as we need to or as softly as we need to. But if we're going to overcome this stuff in our life and not become ineffective, not allow it to infect us with a way that we no longer have an impact for him, we're no longer salt, we're no longer light, we have to choose to redirect our thoughts. So when you read those first three verses and it's all about the pain and the hopelessness of Asaph, we get to verses four through six and he brings that redirected thought of that. He says, you have kept me from closing my eyes, he says. He lay there in the silence, unable to speak, and his mind drifted back to sweeter times. I consider the days of old, years long ago. A night I remember my music, I meditate in my heart, and my spirit ponders. You know, Asaph deliberately focuses thoughts on those past times when God seemed to be near. When we're in a rough spot, we need to remember what we know to be true. We need to chase after the times where we know God was there. That the only time that worked out was because God was there. To remember his wonders. To remember where he walked with us, where he carried us, where he protected us. We have to draw back in on those past times. Because God seemed so near in those times to push back that darkness for Asaph. Then he's going to be there and be so near in our time to push back the darkness in our life now. You look at verse 10 and he talks about how he did this. Because it's easy to talk about, but how do you redirect your thoughts? He says, Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I am going to make force my thoughts out of this dungeon back into the years when I saw God doing great things. In verse 11, he writes, I will remember the Lord's works. Yes, I will remember your ancient wonders. I will reflect on all that you have done and meditate on your actions. What an important step in this process that I don't think we always finish strong with is that when you feel locked down by that depression, by that, that hopelessness, by anything that keeps you from, from redirecting your thoughts, we need to regain perspective in our life. That's where the enemy gets a foothold in our life and he's controlling us and he's dividing us. We're getting hit with those fiery arrows and we need to armor up. You know it to be true. What do you know to be true in your life? You know, when trouble crowds in and just getting up in the morning seems like a chore, where does your mind go? Where do you lean to in those times? It leans toward how bad it is now. 
it's, it's easy to, to think about how far away the future is and how hard it's going to be to get there and how I don't have enough energy and I don't feel good and I, I just don't like this and I want it to go away. That's when it's the most important time for us to call on that mental time out, to take that break, to refresh, to refuel, to get that perspective back. You know, it's ultimately looking at the rear view mirror of our life and seeing where God was so that we get that. You know, one of the things I do personally is I, I've got to have a day to myself. When I get to a place where it gets rough or I start to struggle in my focus, I can't get my mind off and things feel heavy, I've got to have a day to myself. And whether that be I, I take a walk, whether that be I get away and I, I do some things that refuel me like some fishing or some boating or just to be in the woods, we have to have things in place in our life that provoke a perspective shift. And that's what it's really important for us to do. There's actually a, there's actually a, I don't know, an exercise that you can do that's been recommended to me. It's been coined the napkin exercise. I think Chip Ingram has, has mentioned it several times throughout life. And um, when you start to feel like things are going downhill and you start to feel like this is it, they recommend that, that you, you, t you just put a pen in your pocket and you go find a restaurant somewhere. Order yourself something, get yourself an iced tea, get yourself a water, get yourself a soda, sit there, grab a napkin, and start writing things down. Start writing things down that you can think of that would be facts. And ultimately, specific things like, what blessings were you given and do you have today? The blessings that you've had this week, the blessings you've had this month, the blessings you've had this year, the blessings you've had your entire life at this point. And then write those down. Have them in front of you because like, those are facts. Those are truth that you can stand on. And then start listing things like your top 10 answered prayers. List five people that you know love you no matter what. Five people that, that love you just the way you are, just the way you, the way you live, just the way things are going right now, that you can guarantee that they love you. And write down the best things that have happened to you in your life all so that you can redirect your perspective to get you what you want. This, this is not a pointless exercise. This is like a biblical prescription. This gives us the opportunity to shift that perspective to remember that God is above our situation and our circumstance, that he is so much more than all those things in our life. So we, we send an SOS to God, but then we have to choose to redirect those thoughts in order for us to stoke up the hope of our life. Here pretty soon, winter's coming in and people's fireplaces are gonna be going and, and when they leave, they're gonna take those wood stoves and they're gonna stoke them full of stuff. And then they seal them off and they leave for the day and that way when they come back at night, it's still burning, it's still warm. That's ultimately what we're doing with our, with our hope, with ourselves, is that we wanna stoke that up so that way we can get through this time. And when we come out on the other side, there's still some embers, there's still a little flame. It's still warm. It still has the hope of what we needed in remembering that the Lord is above all things. He's above our situation and he's above our circumstance. And you know, when we look at the rest of 77 verses 13 through 20, they ultimately help us take that perspective and magnify God so that way our problems diminish. And that's what we need to do, just like Asaph says. You know, there's, there's something about worship of the Lord that recalibrates our soul, but worship is not a natural instinct of our life, especially if someone is down and burdened. It, it, they don't have a willingness, a hope, or an excitement to worship when things aren't going their way. That gloom kind of closes in. But Asaph willed himself to this worship. He made a choice. And there are deep, deep helpful benefits that we can glean from his story by doing that. He says, the waters saw you, God. The waters saw you. They trembled, even the depths shook, the clouds poured down, the storm clouds thundered, the arrows flashed back and forth, the second of your thunder was in the whirlwind, lighting it up in the world, the earth shook and quaked. You know, doesn't that sound 
like a person who is excited, that sees the power of something good, that goes from something that's helpless to something that is amazing, something that is incredible, something that is just an absolute unbelievable step of knowing. You know, there's a lady by the name of Catherine Green McCreed, and she wrote a book called Darkness and My Only Compassion. It describes really her tortured journey in life through 10 years of expression or depression and bipolar uh, disorder that she had to go through. And, and this is what she says, because ultimately she talks about how God's church helped her. And she says, it is so important to worship in community, to ask your brothers and sisters in Christ to pray for you. Sometimes you literally cannot make it on your own and you need to borrow from the faith of those around you. The companionship in the Lord Jesus is powerful. You know, that's, that's what Asaph is talking about. He concentrates on the benefits to come from God himself. He first proclaims God's holiness. He says, God, your way is holy. That means it's unique. That means it's one of a kind, it's set apart. We can guarantee what other God is like that. What God is great like our God to overcome? You know, in verses 16 and 17, that's what I read. He throws this gauntlet against all the falsehood that's out there. He says, your water, your water saw you. The water saw you. They trembled. Even the depth shook. The clouds poured down water. The storm clouds thundered. Your arrows flashed back and forth, meaning the lightning. Your thunder was like a whirlwind. Lightning lit up the world. The earth shook and quaked. See, worship moved, from, moved him from self-imploding into ultimately being a faithful declarer of the Lord. We have to make the steps in our life to will ourselves into worship of the Lord because it's a perspective shift. It allows us to overcome these things. It, it, God's deliverance in these things is what we look for. I mean, look at what Asaph said in, in verse 14. He says, you are the God who works wonders. You reveal your strength among the people. So when, we, when we're with our, our church, which when I say church, it's not... The building, it's the people, the people who have declared Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. When we're around that, you know, God's, God uses our community, our brothers and sisters in Christ to lift us up, to help overcome. And when we worship together, we willfully cause ourselves to worship the Lord. It brings something else to us. Verses 19 and 20 says, Your way went through the sea, your path through the great waters, but your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Man, God is holy and God is able to do anything. He has no trouble even altering the natural occurrence of life, whether it be the Red Sea being split, whether it be the order of things, the growth of things, the fruit of things. He's willing to change all aspects to deliver you, to deliver you from that darkness, to deliver you from those burdens. Asaph really locks into God's redemption of his people here. Verse 15, he says, With power you redeem your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. That means God cares about me. That means God cares about you. He knows what's happening to you. He knows what's happening in you. He knows and has this supernatural ability to ultimately do all the things necessary to fulfill his promises to us that we can lean on him, which means we can overcome this debilitating ineffectiveness to have an impact for Christ because we feel a burden of hopelessness and depression. I think when the enemy gets a hold of us and he stops us from making that impact, he, he wants to keep us there. And that's where we have to make the conscious, willful choice to not to be obedient to Christ, to worship Him, to overcome, and to get God back above our situation and circumstances and our perspective so that we can walk that out. You know, Asaph began with huge problems and a little God, but as he kept sending up those SOSs to God, he kept asking and kept pouring his heart out. He forced himself ultimately to get, get to the place where he saw those past blessings. And in that hope, 
he was strengthened. And with that strength, he used that to worship and give the glory to God. And because of that, God became big and his problems became small. And I feel like if we spent more time focusing on the Lord and that we would use that to shift our perspective, that the enemy wouldn't have such a foothold in our life. And that's my prayer for everyone today, that we would sit in the fact that ultimately it's our choice. Ultimately, we draw on the Holy Spirit's power. We decide that we're going to be honest with him to overcome. We decide we're going to choose to worship him with others. And we decide we're not going to put ourselves on an island by ourselves to try and figure it out all on our own that we have brothers and sisters in Christ that we can draw on just the same so that in the end we always know that God is above our situation and our circumstances. Would you pray with me here today, Father God? Lord, please, please keep us in the perspective to know, not think, not hope, know that you are above our situation and our circumstances. Lord, that any of this lowliness, this heaviness, this depression, Lord, that we fit in, Lord, it's just an opportunity for us to express that and to share that with you, Lord. And then your promises should fuel us, Lord, to overcome. It should fuel us to change our perspective, Lord, so that we can walk out and remember all the things you've done in our life so that we can continue to make an impact for Christ in this world, Lord. Lord, help us to fight over that. Help us to fight through that so that we can overcome and have that victory and ultimately, Lord, rest in obedience in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for tuning in to this week's message. I hope it was inspirational. I hope there was something that was provoking in it for you, and I hope it's something that you could use to be transformational. We'll see you next time.